Hello, I'm Leonard Nimoy. Welcome aboard 1952, a year of highlights, and in other ways, lowlights. First came Dr. Jonas Salk's vaccine, which in time ended the horrors of childhood polio. Next, replacing one horror with another, the hydrogen bomb was first tested in 1952. Meanwhile, in Hollywood, Jack Webb was just getting the facts, ma'am, on his new TV show, Dragnet. In Rose Bowl action, Stanford was the favorite, but lost to Illinois. Of course, there's much more to follow in this 1952 episode of Our 20th Century. Democratic presidential nominee Adlai Stevenson and his running mate, Senator Sparkman of Alabama, arrive at the White House for a strategy conference with President Truman. A Washington crowd is on hand to view the new standard bearers as they go into a huddle with the chief executive. The president has promised his full support to the Illinois governor and has offered to campaign actively on his behalf. While the Democratic High Command confers, General Eisenhower and his political advisors gather in Denver to map Republican plans. John Foster Dulles is high in the councils as he helps chart a foreign policy course for Senator Nixon, vice presidential candidate, and General Ike. On their decisions rest GOP hopes as the curtain rises on one of the most fateful election years in American history. A new Bunker Hill makes history. This one's in Korea, in our hands at the moment, and U.S. Marines are busy seeing to it that Bunker Hill remains in our hands. Enemy bunkers on Bunker Hill get a going over from grenades as the Leathernecks close in for the kill. A dose of their own medicine slows them down, but only temporarily. His machine gun is jammed, but his isn't, and he pins down the Reds dug in ahead of the advancing Leathernecks. Things are quiet in the truce tents at Panmunjom, not far distant. But on this one small sector of the Korean front, action flares briefly as a Marine detachment carries out its assignment to blast them out or burn them out of their last remaining foothold on Bunker Hill. For the moment, at least, the situation is well in hand. Cuba once again experiences a revolution. The regime of President Carlos Prio Sacaras is ended by a combined group of younger elements of the Army, Navy, and police, headed by former President Fulgencio Batista. The revolution kicked off at 2.43 in the morning, lasted little more than an hour. In another coup staged in 1933, Batista started a rule of disciplined democracy, which lasted for 11 years. This time, the overthrow of the government is almost bloodless. Two palace guards were slain and shortly after deposed President Prio and members of his cabinet took off by plane for Mexico. The former sergeant, now General Fulgencio Batista, comes to Camp Colombia, Cuba's key army base, with his supporters to address his troops and present his case to his countrymen. Batista said he had lost confidence in the Prio government and intends to maintain law and order as a friend of the people until a free election. 1953 for Americans was a year of change. It saw soldier statesman Dwight D. Eisenhower take the oath of office as the nation's first Republican president in 20 years and receive the good wishes of his predecessor, Harry S. Truman. The new chief executive took the reins of government at a climactic moment in the country's history when the solution of foreign and domestic problems pressed for early decision. With a resounding political victory behind him, he faced them with confidence. In Korea, three years of combat end as United Nations and Communist negotiators at Panmunjom sign a truce. The long war undertaken to stop red aggression is over. The enemy holds less territory than before his troops marched, but the cost has been bitter for both sides. With fighting ended, a political conference is slated to deal with the touchy problem of unifying Korea and assuring peace. Neutral observers are already present to oversee adherence to armistice terms. We have won an armistice on a single battleground, not peace in the world. We may not now relax our guard nor cease our quest. Throughout the coming months, during the period of prisoner screening and exchange, and during the possibly longer period of the political conference, 
which looks toward the unification of Korea, we and our United Nation allies must be vigilant against the possibility of untoward developments. In the headlines is the Army's Amazon Annie and the giant mobile cannon that fires both conventional high explosives and atomic artillery shells. A battalion of the terrifyingly potent weapons will be shipped to Europe in support of NATO forces, a significant deployment of the free world's might. And with this announcement comes the first films of Amazon Annie actually firing an atomic shell. the familiar sinister contours of the atomic cloud. A dramatic punctuation mark for these historic Defense Department films of the most lethal blast ever unleashed by any artillery weapon in history. Historic Westminster Abbey in London, scene of colorful pomp and ceremony of empire. A bright spot in the year came with the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. The hopes and hearts of England and the Commonwealth went out to a young queen and to her husband, Duke Philip of Edinburgh. Seeing in a second Elizabeth, a revival of the glories and prestige that were England's in the days of the first Elizabethan era. A story of a queen who wrote bright pages in the story of the year. The wedding of Senator John F. Kennedy recalls Newport's one-time social grandeur. Speaker of the House Martin, Congresswoman Edith North Rogers, Senator and Mrs. Leverett Saltonstall, screen celebrity Marion Davies, and former Ambassador and Mrs. Joseph Kennedy, parents of the groom, are among the personalities on hand to make this the top society wedding of the year. For the spectators outside the church, it's a real storybook wedding. A radiant bride, the former Jacqueline Bouvier, and a handsome groom. With a pretty wife and a politically rising star, the future seems bright for the junior senator from Massachusetts. Christine Jorgensen, who used to answer to George, creates quite a stir as she returns home to New York from Copenhagen. Christine hit the headlines following the series of operations in Denmark that transformed her from a boy into a girl, all of which made her a celebrity to meet and talk to when she stepped off the plane at International Airport. Gentlemen, please give her a chance to talk. I'm very impressed by everyone coming. <laughs> Christine, are you happy to be home? <laughs> yes, of course. What American wouldn't be? Have you been offered a movie contract? Yes, but I haven't accepted it. Do you, uh, do you have any plans regarding the theater? No, I don't think so. Hey, Christine! Uh, are you going to go on with your photography? I hope so, yes. I see. Right. I'm very okay, happy quiet. to be back, and I don't have any plans at the moment. And I thank you all for coming, but I think it's too much. Fine, thank you very much. Spotlight on big screen entertainment at New York's Times Square. The gala premiere of Thunder Bay ushers in a widescreen three times regular size. A new era of motion picture exhibition. Directional sound heightens the entertainment value of the film. A saga of offshore oil drilling. Universal International Executives are among the 3,000 persons attending. Leaders of the motion picture industry, civic officials, stars of stage and screen, thronging into Lowe's State for the world premiere of this history-making picture. The new widescreen, with its tremendous scope for panoramic thrills, lends itself especially to adventure films such as this. The big town goes all out in its welcome. The boys in blue were hard at work when my husband and I arrived. We wouldn't have missed it for the world. Margaret Truman was among the celebrities on hand. The Boris Karloffs and No Frankenstein. Tony Curtis and Janet Lee, the popular Mr. and Mrs. team from Hollywood, greeted by their fans. and a greeting in return by the handsome couple. Xavier Cougat and Abby Lane. The star of the picture, Jimmy Stewart, here for the premiere with the charming Mrs. Stewart, his number one fan. Jimmy Stewart, plus the wonder of full stage screen, plus the miracle of stereophonic sound, plus Thunder Bay, all adding up to entertainment plus. Yes, sir, the Yankees did it. Five straight World Series. Here are the highlights. Game two, Yankee Stadium. All tied up in the eighth, Mickey Mantle facing Preacher Rowe. The 
Oklahoma kid parked it in the left field seats. Hank Barr was on board at the time, so it was two runs for the Yankees and more than enough to give them a 2-0 lead in games over the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Bombers were flying high. Ebbets Field for game number three. Eighth inning, score tied. Roy Campanella stepped in against Vic Rashi. Campy atoned for previous failures at the plate with that one. His round tripper put the Dodgers out front in game three, and they stayed there. Game number four, and Duke Steiner, Dodgers center fielder, is the hero of this game. Steiner is doubled to right in the first inning, drove in two runs, and the Brooks were off and running. Sixth inning, the Duke hit one that was clear out of the park, and there was new life and new hope in Brooklyn. This was the Dodger team that had rolled up all kinds of records in the National League. Boom, another double for Snyder. Hail the Duke of Flatbush. Dodger hopes were riding high. Maybe this was next year. Campy scampered and them bums had tied up the series. Well, it was fun while it lasted, but then came game five. Mickey did it again. Another home run, only this time it was a grand slammer. Three teammates robbed across the plate in a procession of jubilation for Yankee fans. But to Dodger rooters, it had a funereal look. Mickey's wallop was the big blow of the fifth game, and Mickey was the big gun. Back to the stadium for the sixth, and as it turned out, the last game. Dodgers came close. Top of the ninth, Carl Farillo blasted one to the opposite field, dropped it in the right field corner for a home run. A dramatic moment, for with Steiner on base, two runs came home for the Dodgers on Farillo's wallop, and the score was tied at 3-3, but you know the rest. Yanks had Bauer on second, Martin up in the bottom half of the ninth, and Martin laced one right up the middle, his 12th hit of the series, making him the hero of heroes. Bauer scored, and the Yanks won the game and the series. Yes, sir, the Bombers did it again. Five World Series in a row for Casey Stengel and his American League whiz-bangs. They made baseball history.